Hi again, everyone. Gary Digital Williams here on Boxing Law on the Beltway Podcast Network. Here on wherever you have your bot, your listen to your podcast, whether it's on Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Podcast Addict, Google Podcasts, or TuneIn, you can hear the Boxing on Beltway Podcast Network and uh, continue our tributes to some of the great boxers of of uh, boxing on Beltway's uh, history and actually Beltway boxing history in the last thirty some years. And this week, we're going to talk about a boxer that had a very, and I guess the best way to put it is an up and down career. But when it was up, it was really up. And he was the first Beltway boxer to win the champion, the world championship during what I call the Boxing Along the Beltway era, which began in uh, August of 2005. And... um, he was the first to win a world championship in that era. He would win it the very next year. But his career was very interesting. It wasn't a long career in the sense of how many uh, bouts he had. But it was very up and down. Because when he when he would win big bouts, it were big bouts to win. But he would lose some bouts that we would think he would have won. And it was a very interesting career for him. And we'll talk more about that during the course of this podcast. Also... I'm going to give a tribute to a man that passed away. I just found out about this as we record this today. And he was someone that I grew up watching over the years. Was in boxing, was in basketball. But he was a tremendous uh, person and player. And he passed away today at the age of 74. And I just wanted to uh, give my tribute to him. So I will do that as well. The Box on Boatway Podcast Network brought to you as always by Real Time Pain Relief from boxers to ballerinas for shoulder pain and muscle strain, everything in between. Boxing on the Beltway recommends Real Time Pain Relief, the natural, plant based, safe, fast, and effective ointment. You go to freepainoffer.com, buy $10 worth of Real Time Pain Relief. You get a free uh, $10 tube of Real Time Pain Relief, the official pain relief of the 2020 Daytona 500. Rub it on, the pain is gone. In real time. And by DebraSpears.com. She has great weight loss tips, great jewelry, great training methods. All at Debra, D-E-B-R-A, Spears.com. We know I've been very fortunate over the last 36 years. And I have covered 20 world champions from the Beltway area. Uh, When I say covered, I mean I've watched them pretty much from the beginning of either their pro career. Or even going back in some cases, especially in the later years of, of the Boxing on Beltway a podcast and the Box on Bowie blog. Uh, going back to their amateur days, I saw them all throughout the amateurs. You know, guys like Gary Russell Jr., Jared Hurd, uh, Tierra Brown, Tori Nelson, um, Tyshia Douglas, you know, Lamont Peterson. I saw a lot of these guys as amateurs prior to seeing them as champions. And in, in some cases, I mean, in champions in that case, and then early in my Box on Bowie career, got a chance to um, see uh, boxers as they started off young in their pro careers, see them go all the way to the championships. And, of course, in the case of Mark Tushop Johnson, their Hall of, to the International Boxing Hall of Fame. So I've been very blessed in that. And out of all the champions that I have uh, covered over the past 36 years, the man we're going to talk about today is probably the one that most people don't even remember he was a champion because he wasn't a champion very long. In all honesty, he was not a champion very long. And his road to that championship was at many times very bumpy. And even the fact that the, how he won the championship was a little unconventional as well. Talking about a man out of Forestville, Maryland, by the name of Eric Mighty Mouse Aiken. Now, Mighty Mouse Aiken, again, was the first uh, champion out of the Beltway, who was the champ, world champion during the Boxing Along the Beltway area, which goes from 2005 all the way up to the present day. So over a 13-year period, he was he was the first of the Beltway boxers to be a world champion. Now, during during his uh, championship, I mean, during his, his time, again, he was a very interesting career. He made his pro debut... On January 12, 2001, at the San Casino Hotel in Lansing, New Jersey, scored a third-round knockout over that undefeated, he's only 2-0, Giovanni Collado. 
But the second bout he had in June of 2001, June 16, 2001, it was in Yonkers, New York at the Murray Skating Center, and he lost that bout by four round unanimous decisions. So already he was off to a to a weird start. He spent a lot of Eric spent a lot of time early part of his career fighting out of Tacoma, Washington, and the Emerald Queen Casino, and also in the exhibition hall in Tacoma. He fought out of out of out of that area. He was managed by people out of that area. Remember, I can't remember who they were. He was managed out of people out of that area, and he would uh, fight a lot of his time early on in that section of the country. He won a four-round unanimous decision over Angelo Luis Torres on November 10, 2001 at the Emerald Queen Casino. And then he would come back in June of 2002 and win a first-round knockout over uh, the same Angelo Luis Torres in Tacoma, Washington as well. His first bout in the Beltway took place at the D.C. Tunnel, which is now known as D.C. Star, on June 15, 2002, when he Aiken would score a fourth-round TKO over Edward Anderson. Uh, that was on June 15th. And he would come back and, and shuttle between D.C. and Washington State through part of his career. A lot of his career. He started getting knockouts, known for knockouts. He had a string of... Six straight knockouts between June of 2002 and uh, August of 2003. Uh, he fought a lot of uh, guys with up and down records, but he would really uh, uh, have a um, knockout string going in 2000 and 2001 to 2003. Now, we're situated here in... Uh, in the Beltway during uh, 2003, where a guy that I know very well, a good friend of mine, who was out of Morgan State University, was later on a, uh, a sportscaster in Ohio, a number of years. His name was Ronnie Duncan. Ronnie started uh, started to resurrect boxing in the area on television. He did a show for cable, a uh, city cable 16 at that time in D.C., Washington D.C., where they had a boxing show. I was in part of. Uh, Somewhat involved with it. It wasn't a whole lot I did with that show because Dun Ronnie Duncan did a lot of the play by play. So I wasn't that much involved with the show. But I do remember being, I think, a part of uh, a couple of shows that they did. I think the first one I did was this one. And on December 13, 2003, at the Washington, Old Washington Convention Center in D.C., Eric Aiken would have his first six round bout against a man named Agnaldo Nunez. And it was really an outstanding bout. It really was a great bout. Uh, went either way, and I think some people thought Aiken might have lost that bout, but he would win a six-round unanimous decision over Agnaldo Nunez at the Washington Convention Center. And that would really kind of be a catalyst for him because it really what he would, would get him into bigger bouts if he would want them. And sometimes he didn't want them, and sometimes he would not perform very well with them. For example... Uh, three fights later, he would fight Al Seeger in his first eight-round bout. Oh, I'm sorry, second eight-round bout at the um, Kewadin Casino in Salt St. Marie. I believe that's in Illinois, I think. And that was on November, uh, September 16, 2004. He would lose an eight-round unanimous decision to Al Seeger in that bout. Al Seeger came in that bout with a record of, a record of 19 and 1. Uh, he would bounce back. He would fight uh, Terrence Roy. On January 8th, 2005 at the Emerald Queen Casino. And he would win a second round t second round knockout. But he would come back the very next bout on October 1st, 2005. He'd lose a six round split decision to Leo Martinez in Columbus, Ohio. And again, this is how his, his, his uh, career was. Aiken's career was at the time. Really up and down at the time. Um... He bounced back from that bout, and he would win a first-round knockout over uh, John Scalzi. That was on December 9th, 2005 at the Wheeling Island Race uh, Casino Racetrack in Wheeling, West Virginia. First-round knockout there. But again, Martinez was 6-5, and five, and Scalzi was 15-36 going into that bout. Then he would come back, and he would win. He would come in, and, and on January 20th, 2006, he would win the NABA Featherweight Championship with a seventh round TKO over Darby Smart. Smart. And you thought at that time, well, Aiken has righted the ship, so to speak. He has gotten back together. And he is um, should be in very good shape. However, the very next bout, March 18, 2006, he would lose a non-title six round unanimous decision 
to Johnny Edwards. Now, Johnny Edwards was undefeated at the time, 5-0. and oh, And he would lose to, a- to Eric Edwards on that bout. So, he still had the NABF title, but uh, he would really uh, not be able to kind of capitalize that at that time. However, the very next bout he had was a big one. It was for, I believe, the USBA Featherweight Championship. He took on former IBF Featherweight Champion, Tim Austin. That was on April 1st, 2006 at the Wolstein Center in, I believe, Illinois. And he would beat Austin by six-round TKO. It was amazing. He, he, it was he, amazing. He win that bout. It was a big win for him. And I think it led in some part to this next bout. Now, he took, he would win the USBA title and then get the shot at the IBF Featherweight Championship against Valdemir Pereira. That was on May 3rd, 2006 at the TD Bank, Bank North Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, a little history about that bout. <clears throat> Aiken took the bout against Pereira on just 10 days notice. I don't know, I can't remember what exactly happened in that situation, but he was supposed to not fight on the card for that championship. He'd fight on the undercard. And then some strange things took took place. And he would end up getting the bout against Pereira for the IBF featherweight championship. And he would knock Pereira down twice. Or Aiken knocked Pereira down twice during the bout. And go on to win the bout by eighth round disqualification. Pereira got frustrated during this bout, and he hit uh, Aiken low. Referee saw it. Referee Charles Dwyer saw it, and he went on to give Aiken the bout. So Aiken became the new IBF World Featherweight Championship champion by eighth round disqualification over Valdemir Pereira. However, Aiken's reign would not last long. Just four months later, on September 2nd, 2006, in the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California, Aiken would lose by eighth round stoppage to a very, very good boxer, great boxer by the name of Robert Goodetto, Robert the Ghost Goodetto. And he would, and Goodetto would stop Aiken in the eighth round, and he would, uh, and Aiken would lose that world title. And Goodetto went on to hold that title for a little bit of time, too. No question about it. He dominated Aiken that bout. Goodetto just dominated Aiken. Um,. He was well ahead on uh, Guerrero was well ahead on the scorecards and deservedly so. It was a it was not a good night for Eric Aiken. So that's how he lost the title. But at that point, he was the um, first beltway boxer to win a world title in the boxing on beltway era. He was also the first person to win the boxing on beltway boxer of the year award that year in two thousand six. From there. Um, Aiken's career really went on a downward spot. He didn't, never really recovered from the loss to Guerrero. He had a 10-round split decision draw against Cruz Carbajal. Now, that was on March 16, 2007 in Salem, New Hampshire. And <clears throat> originally, Aiken was supposed to fight Pereira again. Then Pereira had issues uh, with his medicals and he ended up fighting Cruz Carbajal. And really, he did not know, Aiken did not know who he was going to fight until really the day before the bout took place. And that was really strange there. No question about that. But he had a 10-round draw there. Uh, on November 12, 2007, uh, Aiken challenged for the IBO, the International Boxing Organization World Featherweight title, against Thomas Mashaba, who was 19-1-4. And, and Mashaba won a ninth-round TKO. Aiken would come back and fight on February 1, 2008. Lose a seventh round TKO to Monty Two Guns Meza Clay, and uh, that was a tough bout. Uh, he would come to the back into the area on September tenth, two thousand eleven. Took about three years off, and he would take on Todd White Lightning Wilson out of out of uh, Virginia at the Patriot Center in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, now the Eagle Bank Arena. He would lose, and Wilson would win a six round unanimous decision. He had a no contest against Ed, Edna Cherry Cherry Bomb Cherry. On September 23rd, 2011, at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, that was a first round no contest. Aiken couldn't continue after getting hit after the bell in that bout. Uh, he had opportunities against uh, Rafael Marquez on February 5th, 2000. I'm sorry, May 5th, 2012. 
He would lose to him in Tijuana, Mexico by first round knockout. By this time, Aiken's career was well over. I mean, he really had no business being in the ring at this point. Uh, and we were trying to tell him to stop. And it became blatantly evident, evident to me he had no he no longer belonged in the ring. Is when he fought Brian Jargo at fight night on November 1st, 2012 and lost by first round TKO. And he was he was really bad time more than done. He lose his last bout on uh, February on December 12, 2015 to uh to Adam uh, Lopez at Montilla Lopez in Texas, Dallas, Texas. He lose by second round, third round TKO of that bout. So Aiken never had another win in his career after he won the world title to Valdemir Pereira. His uh, final record was uh, 13 and 11 with one draw. And oh, he had at least, let's see, he had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven knockouts in his career. And that is the story, as short as it was, of Eric Mighty Miles Aiken. He's doing well right now. I mean, let me phrase, let me uh, we, we, uh Answer. I think it's 11, 14 and 1, 14 and 11 with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11, knock, 12 knockouts, 12 knockouts. So that is the career of Eric Mighty Mouse Aiken out of uh, Forestville, Maryland. And um, yeah, it was it was a very interesting career. I mean, it wasn't, no, wasn't, a, wasn't as special. A lot of people really don't even remember that he was world champion. And he was a um, good fighter at times, but really he, he did not at times live up to his his abilities. But he was able to still win a world championship. He never take that away from him. So that's the story of Eric Mighty Mouse Aiken. In a couple of weeks, we're going to start talk about how this blog, how our blog of this uh, podcast, BoxingOnBoy.blogspot.com, how that really got started. And we'll talk about the one bout that turned it, that, that that really gave me the impetus to start boxing on the Beltway, okay, back in 2005. We'll talk about that in, in the next couple weeks or so. Before we get out of here, I have to give this tribute. Um, I love all sports, you know, I, I really do. I, I've been a big fan. I really uh, started off as a baseball fan growing up, uh, as a Washington, your Washington Senators back in the day, back in the late 60s, early 70s. And, of course, when the Senators left uh, D.C. in 1971 to become the Texas Rangers, I became a Baltimore Orioles fan. I was an Orioles fan, and still am to a certain extent, but really became an Orioles fan up until the Nationals came into uh, Washington, D.C. But um, the best sport for me at that time, in the 70s especially, was basketball. Basketball was really big in this area, uh, 1780. And if you ever watch, if you had a chance to watch the documentary on um, Prince George County basketball by Kevin Durant into the water. You can see how great this area was. And that's just Prince George's County. I could give the, a lot of the information about the DC part of basketball in that same time period. And a little later on as well. Um, we, you know, DC and PG County, and Montgomery County and, and uh, even parts of Virginia, we had outstanding high school basketball in that area. In high school, we had great college basketball as well. And for a short period of time, in the 70s especially, we had great pro basketball. And that was because of the Baltimore slash Capitol slash Washington Bullets. And the mainstay of that franchise at that time passed away today. I believe actually may have passed on Monday, but they listed it today. His name was Wes Unsell. Now, if, unless you're an old time basketball fan, you probably never heard that name. But for me, Wes Unsell was the rock of the Washington, Baltimore Washington Bullets, Capital Washington Bullets. He was drafted by the Bullets in 1968 out of the University of Louisville. We had an outstanding um, college career at University of Louisville. He, many people say, even more so than Daryl Griffith, that Wes Unsell may have been the greatest player to ever come out of the University of Louisville. I don't know. That's up for debate. But he, be, he was drafted by the Bullets, and he, the Baltimore Bulls at that time, and he used to play in 1969 with the Bullets. 
And he did something that only one other player in the history of the National Basketball Association ever did. And that was he was named Rookie of the Year and Most Valuable Player in the very same year. 1969's Rookie Year. He was named Rookie of the Year and MVP. The only other person to do that was the great Will Chamberlain. Now, Wes Unseld was only, and is, I've been reading as of late, that it was up for debate how tall he really was. He was always listed as 6'7", which is still very short, especially for the, the centers of that time. And we'll go over that name, let that list in just a moment, because it's a who's who. But, he was 6'7", weighed about 240, so he was he was large. He wasn't tall, but he was large. And he used that, that, that bulk to his great advantage. He set some of the most monster picks that you ever wanted to see in your life during that during his career. Um, 1968, again, 1969, you say he was rookie year MVP. And again, he played against some of the greatest centers in the history of of the NBA. Now he, he played in the tail end of Bill Russell's career. But he's best Unsell's best known for playing against guys like Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Dave Cowens, Nate Thurman, Bob Lanier, Willis Reed. You know, these guys were huge guys in comparison to Unsell. But somehow he would play them so well defensively, and no one I mean, people have said that he was the best player that they played against, individual player that they played against. And it was great to see that. And there's one other thing about Wes Unsell that always admired him. Wes Unsell, Wes Unsell threw outlet passes like nobody's business. He was the greatest outlet passer. For those who don't know what outlet passes, that's when you get the rebound and you throw it down the court, like maybe halfway down the court, and try to start a fast break going. No one did that better than Wes Unsell. Matter of fact, there, there's stories, and I think it's true, I've heard many of the, his teammates say this, that during practice, he would be able to get a rebound, turn his body in midair, and throw an outlet pass before his feet hit the ground. Now, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure he might have done it a few times during the games, but he definitely did it all the time during practice. And he was the captain. He was the rock of the uh, Washington Bullets. And, of course, again, the Bullets were huge. I was a huge fan of Washington Bullets. And there were two players that I even tried to halfway pattern my game in high school about uh, against, uh, alongside. Tried to pattern them with. One was Elvin Hayes, who was his teammate. And Wes Unsell. Now, Wes Unsell, let me go back a little bit. Wes Unsell was here when um, the, the Bullets went to the NBA championship in 1971. They took on uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Oscar Robinson, Bobby Dandridge, and the Milwaukee Bucks that year. And the Bucks would sweep the Bullets in, in uh, four straight games in the finals in 1971. Elvin Hayes wasn't with the team at the time. Elvin Hayes was still in Houston. And they traded for Elvin in, I believe, 1973. And in 1975, they have a record, team record. They, they, they notched a team record for wins in a season that still holds up today in the franchise history. 60 wins in 1975 under head coach K.C. Jones. But they were beaten by the Golden State Warriors, Rick Barry, Nate Thurman, um, Jamal Wilkes, I guess it was Keith Wilkes at that time, but Jamal Wilkes and Clifford Ray in the, uh, and head coach Al Adels, uh, they beat him in four straight in 1975. So we didn't know whether or not the Wizards, the Bullets, should say, would ever win a world championship, an NBA championship. They called it world championship back in those days. 1978 comes around and we get a key player named Bobby Dandridge, who came over from the Bucks in 1971, from 1971, and came over to the Bullets, and he would be the piece they needed to go over the hump. However, Wes Unsell's presence was still 
major in that situation. West Sunside had been in the league for 10 years. His knees were horrible. I don't know. I, a lot of people say how he'd get up there and play with the bad knees that he had, but he would persevere. And as I said, I, I tried to pattern my game after Elvin Hayes and West Sunset in two ways. For Elvin Hayes, it was his deadly turnaround jumper. I wanted to learn that so badly. <laughs> and, I, and I did okay with it, I guess, my, my during my years in high school uh, playing basketball. But from Wes Unsell, I tried to learn leadership. And leadership with by being intense on the court, but being quiet and unassuming off the court. And I think when I look back um, in my high school, I was doing a lot of that today. I really believe that I took that from him. And I think that may be the reason why I was able to, I think I told a story a few weeks back on the podcast about how I was at a basketball camp with the late great Morgan Wooten, the former head basketball coach at DeMatha High School, who passed away early this year. And I talked about how I wasn't the best player on the court. I wasn't I wasn't anywhere near as talented as some of the guys who were there, but I won the outstanding camp of that month that year that summer because of my attitude. And my attitude was kind of like Wes Unsell's attitude. I could be very intense on the court and and yell and scream and all that, but you know, I tried to make other players on my team look better. And that's what Wes Unsell did amazingly well. So nineteen seventy eight, my freshman year in high school. Um, the Bullets go to the finals and they uh, play to see then Seattle Supersonics, now the Oklahoma City Thunder in the championship. And neither team was supposed to be there. And in the Eastern Conference Finals that year against Philadelphia, and of course Philadelphia had just come off, come off losing the NBA title, uh, NBA Finals to Portland in 1977. They told their fans that they owed them one. We owe you one, they said. And, of course, the Sixers had um, guys like Julius Irving. They had Mo Cheeks. They had Caldwell Jones, Daryl Dawkins, uh, Bobby Jones, Steve Mix. They had a great team, uh, World Be Free, or at that time it was Lloyd Free. But he would, he would, they were on that team. It was a great team. Henry Bibby was on that team. And it, it was a great series. And the way the, the Bullets won that series was when um, they got two key rebounds in game six, at the end of game six, from Wes Unsell. And that's how they won that game. It was a great, great game. And they went on to go to the finals, and they would play, they'd go up against um, Seattle Supersonics. With that time, they had Jack Sigma, Sigma, I should say. They had uh, Gus Williams, Dennis Johnson, had great players. And... Um, they would win that series, and they would end up winning the series thanks to two free throws from West Sunsell. And they win a championship, their first and still only NBA uh, championship. Uh, they um, they played a great, great series, and to see a Poland embrace West Sunsell and say, yes, you won that title. It was an amazing, an amazing, amazing time in Bullets history. Um, one of the key moments for me in Wes Unsell's career was when he retired. He was the first player from the um, Bullets to <clears throat> get his number retired, number 41. And I saw it happen. saw his number get raised to the rafters that day. Tremendous, tremendous moment. Um, he would go on. After his um, career, he would become a broadcaster for the team. He would uh, be a vice president, a head coach, and a general manager for the Washington Bullets. He was a lifelong bullet. His entire career was with the Washington Bullets. And again, that's rare these days now. But um, he had he, he did great things in the community. He and his uh, wife, Connie started a school, an elementary school in Baltimore, in West Baltimore, that I pass by every time I go to Coppin State University. It's on Hilton Street in Baltimore, and it is um, 
that is the uh, unsell school. It's an elementary school in Baltimore. That I, again, I pass by every day. Every time I go to Coppin State University, it's on my left hand side going going to Coppin State. And I I look at it a lot, and I say, well, this is what West Sunsell did, you know, incredible. And his family's still involved with the school. I think his his wife is the principal, and his one of his daughters is one of the teachers there. I said West used to drive the bus, the the school bus there. They were very much involved with that school, and have been for over the years. Um. He was a remarkable man. I had a, I had the opportunity to meet him, meet Wes Unsell. Uh, there was a function that the entire uh, Capital Center organization, including the Bullets and the Capitals, would do. When Aunt they would uh, give uh, give uh, presents to kids during the Christmas holidays, and one year I did get, I did a little documentary with uh, my friend Rudy Childs, who produced helped produce Boxing Spotlight. We did a um, did a film for them and uh, <clears throat> talked to people, talked to kids, talked to West Unsell. We talked to A. Poland, the owner of the Bullets and Capitals and Capital Center. And it was a great moment. It really was great, great time had for us during that. And West Unsell is a, a really, really cla- was a really, really classy guy. And again, quiet, un- unassuming, didn't want the limelight on him, but that's why he's in the Hall of Fame. NBA Hall, the, the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. He's in the College Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, he's one of the. He was one of the in the 50th anniversary of of, uh, of professional basketball, the NBA. He was one of the 50 greatest players of all time, and it was easy to see why. Um, just a great, great person, and I knew he'd been sick for quite some time. He had uh, complications from pneumonia, and he did not make the 40th anniversary. Uh, reunion of the um, of the championship team from 1978. He was not there. I think he, he did send a film in, send a video in, but he did not uh, attend the the function. And we had already lost two other players from that uh, team. Greg Ballard had passed away, as did Charles Johnson. Um, but Wes Unsell was quite a guy. He really was a great, great player. He passed away, we heard today, at the age of 74 from complications from pneumonia. And just a great, great player. He really was a great, great man. No question about that. And we're going to miss Wes Unsell. No question. That'll do it for another edition of Beltway Boxing and Boxing on Beltway Podcast Network. And we thank you for honoring this tribute to Paul Wes Unsell as well. We hope to talk to you again. Hope to have some information at some point with some news. I've heard some, some news down the pike or boxing in this area. So as soon as we find out, we'll definitely let you know. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at Digital25. So once again, we're about to you by uh, Real Time Pain Relief and DebraSpirits.com. I'm Gary Digital Win. Thank you so much for joining us. Always remember, keep supporting the best boxing in the world, the boxing along the beltway. Thanks for listening. Take care.